Okay, hi guys. So in today's video, it's quite a highly requested one. I've gotten many, many requests um, to do a video like this. Uh, it's going to be a guide to investing in Singapore for rookies, for new investors uh, looking to start investing. So I've done up some slides, uh, which I'll flash on screen right now. Um, it's one one guide to investing. So let's just dive right in. Okay, so the table of contents is as follows. First of all, we'll talk about what you should be looking to invest in. Next, what are the different asset classes and what do asset classes mean in the first place? Then we'll talk about where you can invest into these different asset classes, how you can start investing, and we'll end it off with any last tips. Okay, so first of all, what should you be looking to invest in? I think the very first question to ask yourself is actually, what kind of investor do you want to be? Right, you can either be an active investor or a passive investor. So what are the differences between these two? Right? For an active investor, you typically want to actively manage your portfolio on a day-to-day -day basis. You do your own research and analysis, you keep your pulse on the market, meaning you really keep up with the market, you know what's happening on a day-to-day, -day, on a week-to-week. Uh, you also do your own TA and FA, which stands for technical analysis, fundamental analysis. And a passive investor, on the other hand, um, you prefer someone to manage your portfolio. You feel that the learning curve is a little bit too steep and you're not really interested in learning to invest yourself. You also have, you might also not have the time to manage your own portfolio. Okay, so for those of you who chose number one, you want to be an active investor, I will be going through uh, the fundamentals to investing in the next couple of slides. For those of you who chose number two, if you want to be a passive investor, right, I would implore you to reach out to someone that you really trust in the investment management space. It can be wealth management, it can be financial advisory, as long as they know what they're doing, reach out to them, right? On the off chance, if you don't have anyone at the top of your head, please feel free to reach out to me. My Instagram is justinsung4. And for those of you who have no idea, you guys don't know if you want to be an active investor or a passive investor, stick around to the end of the video and maybe you will have a decision at that point. Okay, so next, what are the different asset classes, right? First of all, you have equities, which are essentially things like stocks, um, ETFs, which stand for exchange traded funds. You have UTs, which stands for unit trusts. You have fixed income instruments like bonds, savings plans, endowment plans, fixed deposits commonly known as fixed Ds or FDs. Next, you also have all investments, which is short for alternate investments. You have things like private equities, VCs, which are venture capitalists, growth equity, LBOs, and crypto. You have many, many things that fall under the all investments space. And next, you have cash. It can be liquid cash in the bank. It can be physical cash, any, anything that constitutes cash or cash equivalents. Okay, so now that we have the umbrella category of what asset classes are, let me break down each of these individual asset classes so you get a better idea, better understanding, right? So first and foremost, equities. Um, the definition is as follows. You guys can read it yourself. Um, some of the examples of equities are stocks and shares. It can be UTs, unit trusts. It can be exchange traded funds, commonly known as ETFs can be mutual funds. And just so you guys know, these three UTs, ETFs, and mutual funds, they essentially are invested into the same underlying assets, which is a basket of stocks. So a stock or a share can be, for example, a Microsoft stock, an Apple stock, right? You're essentially buying stocks of Microsoft, stocks of Apple, stocks of Amazon. When you invest into a UT or an exchange traded fund, ETF or mutual fund, you are essentially investing into a basket of stocks. So meaning to say that, um, when you invest into an ETF, for example, you're investing into generally 50 to 100 different stocks in one fund. So you can say that UTs, ETFs or mutual funds are generally safer than buying into singular stocks and shares because if you invest into say Microsoft for example, and let's just say Microsoft takes a beating, right? They, they fall short of their projected revenues, they, their EPS drops. These are things that could potentially happen if you invest into one company. And if you're investing into Microsoft and that happens, Microsoft's stock tanks and so does your money. Whereas if you're invested into UTs, ETFs, they are a basket of stocks. So even if five companies out of that 100 stocks that you're invested into, of 100 companies that you're invested into, doesn't do well, you still have the other 90, 95 companies to negate your losses. Unless all 100 companies don't do well, then yes, fine, your entire fund goes down. But investing into a basket of stocks is generally safer than investing into just one stock. Okay, so another thing that you will hear very commonly if you ask your friends, what should I invest in? A lot of them will just say, just invest into an ETF, just invest into an index, S&P, so on and so forth. ETFs have generally lower expense ratios, or expense ratios also mean fees, or just take it as management fees, okay? So the management fees or the expense ratios in ETFs tend to be slightly lower 
as compared to mutual funds because ETFs typically trade using an algorithm to track an index. Mutual funds on the other hand are actively managed meaning to say you have portfolio managers or fund managers doing the buying and selling on an intraday basis so because of that you actually need to pay a higher management fee as you would in an ETF because ETFs are passively managed and mutual funds are actively managed but that brings about another argument which is very common right you see a lot of articles saying that or oh, you know actively managed mutual funds underperform ETFs so actually you're just better off buying an index fund or an ETF ETFs are interchangeable with index fund so a lot of them say that you know 70 80 percent of mutual funds actually underperform passively uh, managed ETFs or indices but there are still certain instances where I would recommend mutual funds to clients as opposed to ETFs first of all even though as you can see 70 percent to 80 percent of actively managed mutual funds underperform passively managed ETFs. And that is exactly why I'm recommending the 20 to 30 percent of mutual funds that actually outperform the ETFs to my clients. So yes, I understand sometimes it can be better to invest into an ETF, but sometimes mutual funds do have their perks as well. Okay, anyway, that's that. Um, next, let's move on to stocks, right? Definition of stocks is as follows. You guys can read it. Examples of stocks, like I mentioned, Microsoft. Okay, so like Microsoft, for example. So every stock or ETF will have a ticker symbol. So what a ticker symbol is, essentially, it is an abbreviation used to uniquely identify publicly traded shares on the stock market or stock exchange, right? So for Microsoft, it's MSFT. So as you can see here, MSFT, this is from Tiger Brokers. Next, you can see Apple. Apple's ticker symbol is AAPL. Amazon is AMZN, as you can see. So most of the company's ticker symbols will be a shortened uh, uh, abbreviation of the name. But there are certain uh, companies that are very creative in their creation of ticker symbols. I'll give you an example. I'm not sure if you've heard of Slack Technology. It's the company. It's very, very popular during COVID. So the name of the company is Slack. Anyone wants to guess what the ticker symbol of Slack is? So it's actually work. So very cute lah, you know, the name of the company is called Slack, but their ticker symbol is work. It's totally opposite. It's a really fun story to tell, right? So then you also have another company called 3M. I'm pretty sure most of you know the company 3M. You use their tapes everywhere, right? So the ticker symbol for 3M is actually MMM. So it's really interesting, you know, people would just think 3M was the ticker symbol, probably just 3M, right? But it's literally 3M, MMM, okay? So interesting. But anyway, let's move on before I digress too much. Right, okay, so that's equities. Next, we'll look at what fixed income instruments are. Okay, so for fixed Ds, they're typically very short tenure instruments between three months to 36 months. The shorter the tenure, the lower the interest rates and vice versa. But of course, this is not the case all the time. Like in the current climate, the 12-month fixed D rates are around 3 to 4%. But if you look at the 24-month fixed D rates, they are slightly lower than that because we're in a recession right now. And um, interest rates fluctuate with the economic condition. So now we are in a high interest rate environment, which is why interest rates are as such 3 to 4% per year. But if this was 3 years ago, 4 years ago, interest rates for 12-month fixed Ds, you're only looking at around 1 to 1.5%. Um, there will be no penalties for withdrawing early. You just lose the accrued interest. So for example, if you put your money into a 12-month fixed D, that 20,000, and you're promised maybe 4% after 12 months. But six months in, you decide, I really need to break this fixed D. I really need to take out the money. You can do so and you don't lose any, uh, there's no penalty. The only thing you lose is the interest you would have accrued over those, for example, six months. But your capital of 20,000 that you might have put in is still guaranteed. You still get back the 20,000. Next, um, they are considered as a relatively liquid type of asset class, I would say, because they are very short term, very, very short term, and there are no penalties. So technically, you can take it out anytime you want. Okay, so next are uh, endowment and savings plans. These are very, very common in FAs, in insurance company, or in banks as well. So it typically has very long tenures, 10 to 30 years. Of course, I know you have very short endowment plans, like two to three years, but typically, um, they are longer tenure as compared to fixed Ds. Um, the shorter the tenure, lower interest rates, vice versa, this one is quite set in stone. Um, usually the two-year endowment plans are not going to be as high as your 20, 30-year endowment plans um, if you're talking about ROI. Um, returns are a mixture of guaranteed and non-guaranteed. So the guaranteed portion is typically very low. I'll give you an example. A 20-year endowment plan, the guaranteed can be around 0.6, 0.7% per annum. And the non-guaranteed can go as high, you know, maybe 1% to 2% per annum. So if you add the guaranteed and the non-guaranteed portion together, you're looking at around maybe 2% per annum interest, which to me is still losing out to inflation rate, which is why I personally am not a fan of endowment plans. I 
never would recommend one to a client, never would buy one myself. Um, but that's just that's just me because I'm slightly more mid to high risk. I know that there are there is definitely a market for people who are you know interested in endowment savings plans. Um, they have a very high surrender charge if you terminate it early, meaning if you invest say 2004 a year, second, third year you decide, I don't want to wait the whole 20 years, I want to take it out now. You essentially lose probably 95% of your money. Of course, the, the surrender charge drops every year, but during your first couple of years, surrender charge is very, very high. Um, there's close to no liquidity. I know some endowment plans allow you to withdraw a certain amount every year uh, or a certain amount after 10, 20 years, but typically the bulk of your money has to be stuck inside for that 25 to 30 years generally has very very low returns um, but it's guaranteed it's capital guaranteed and returns they have a very small portion that's guaranteed but generally low returns as compared to investments in the stock market annuities or retirement plans okay so these are very similar to endowment plans also have very long uh, tenures time horizons um, also same as uh, endowment plans pretty much everything here is the same as endowment plans lah, um, but Annuities or retirement plans are something where you pay for, say, 10 years, and then maybe you wait until you're 50 years old, and then it pays you out for 10, 15 years or 20 years. It's essentially just to fund your retirement from, you know, 60 to 80 years or something like that. Okay, so now that covers the fixed income instrument side of things. Um, in all investments, I'm not going to cover so much of that because if you're watching this, you typically would not want to dabble into private equities or crypto so quickly. You want to settle your basis first, so I'm not going to dive too much into that. And cash, like I mentioned, that's one of the asset classes as well. Okay, Nick, so what platforms should you use to invest? Right, there are multiple platforms that you can use for DIY trading platforms. Uh, you have Tiger Brokers, Mumu, eToro. So the asset classes that are available to trade on these platforms are as follows. Right, You primarily trade stocks and shares or ETFs on these platforms, but you can also buy into certain mutual funds and UTs. Next, uh, for robo-advisors, you have Stive, Endower, Stash Away. These are very common asset classes available primarily um, robo-advisors invest your money into ETFs. Lah. So that's generally it. But I know that Scythe now allows you to trade fractional shares on their platform. So that's also one of them. Next, you have banks. Banks like DBS, OCBC, UOB. I'm pretty sure you know them. So the asset classes available to purchase from banks are as follows. Primarily, it's UTs and fixed Ds. Um, stocks and shares as well. But ETFs, um, leveraged products and structured products are not so common. So I'm not going to dive too deep into that. Next, you have investment firms like IFAS, Tiger Brokers, Navigator. These are some of the asset classes primarily available. UTs, stocks and shares, ETFs and bonds, not so much, but mainly um, you can approach them for UTs. Right? So these are generally where you can find the respective asset classes, as I mentioned. I'm not going to go in so in-depth into how to create an account because I think that's quite self-explanatory. Um, certain investment firms require you to have a dedicated investment manager managing your account like um, IFAS. So if any of you guys want to invest via IFAS or Tiger Brokers, you just let me know because my company partners up with them. I can do the account creation and, and management of your account for you. Okay, so how do you start, right? These are certain questions you want to ask yourself before you even start investing or looking for a particular asset class or a particular platform to put your money into. So some of the basic questions to ask are, what's your risk appetite? Is it low, mid or high risk? Next, what are your near-term and long-term investing goals? Because you don't want to just invest with no goal in mind. I mean, you can, you can just invest because, oh, my friends are investing, oh, because I don't want to leave my money in the bank. But really crafting and developing your near-term and your long-term goals will really help you dictate what kind of investments you should be putting your money into. i give you an example. If you're looking for long-term retirement planning, you can put some of your money into slightly higher risk um, asset classes like stocks, you know, equities. Uh, but if you're looking at very near-term goals, like I have three to four years um, before I down pay my BTO, right? So I need the money out in three to four years time. Then you don't want to be putting your money into something so high risk like stocks or maybe even crypto. You want to be putting your money into something slightly safer, maybe ETFs, UTs, mutual funds, something like that. You want to have at least some form of liquidity on the side if you need to withdraw the money. So these are essentially why you need to develop your near-term and long-term goals. Next, you also want to ask yourself, what's the budget you have in mind or would you prefer to follow a guideline? Right, The guideline says you should be investing roughly 20-25% of your income. Um, I personally invest way more than 25% of my income, but that's just because I have already developed my near-term and long-term goals. I have a certain amount of money set aside for my very short-term ones, um, like buying a house. And I also have a certain amount of money set aside for my very, very long-term goals, like retirement planning. And I know I'm only 25, 26 this year, but I'm already planning for retirement. I'm just that kiasu 
and I just just want to have a head start, you know. People would never think to plan for retirement when they're in their 20s. They will only start to plan when they're in their 30, late 30s to early 40s. And to me, I definitely, I mean, I myself am in the financial advisory space. I'm in the investment management space. I know the law of compounding. I know what exponential growth is. There's no way in hell I'm waiting till I'm 30s or in my 40s to plan for retirement. And I know that you don't even need to set aside a huge amount of money when I'm young to plan for retirement because a lot of people are thinking, I don't have enough money for my BTO or for my down payment. How do you want me to set aside money for my retirement? Honestly, I'm not even setting aside a lot of money for my retirement planning. I'm just putting in a little bit of money every month, every year. And I know that it's going to compound into the millions of dollars by the time I turn 50 or even more if, if I wait until 60. But anyway, that's a story for another time. So some of the more advanced questions you can ask yourself, maybe if you guys are actually not that rookie yourselves or you have an RM working with you, um, what investing strategy would you want to employ over the next six to 12 months, right? Now we're going into a recession in the second half of the year. Do you want to be holding a lot of tech stocks? Do you want to have a lot of exposure to US equities? What is it you want to employ, right? These are things that you want to ask yourself or your RM, IM, IC, FA, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so how do you diversify in terms of asset class, region, sector, and time horizon? Because, you know, a lot of people talk about diversification or oh, diversify this, diversify that. And they usually think that, oh, I'm invested in the US, China, Europe, that is diversified. That's not, that's not what proper diversification is. You want to diversify across the different asset classes. You want to have a, a good balance between equities, a good balance between bonds. You want to have some real estate. You want to have some REITs. You want to have some this and that. You even want to stagger your investments over a short term, mid term and long term. Why? Because you want money coming out at every different phase of your life. You don't want all the money coming out only when you're 50, all the money only coming out when you're 35. You want to stagger so that some comes out when you're 31, some comes out when you're 34, some at 38, 50, along the way, so on and so forth. You, you get the drift. Another question is how many percent to allocate to the different asset classes? Do I want to have 30% equity, 70% bonds? Or what's the kind of exposure do I want to have towards the US region, the China region? Right, so these are some of the questions you want to ask yourself. I think the last question is, yeah, how do I employ risk management strategies? Right, so that being said, basic questions, these are more DIY. You can just ask yourself these questions. Of course, if you don't know what constitutes to a low risk appetite, mid risk appetite, feel free to reach out to a trusted financial advisor, consultant or an RM or like I said, can always reach out to me on Instagram at justinsung4. And some of the advanced questions, ask your consultant if you're quite new. Um, I'm pretty sure that if you are a savvy investor, you won't be watching my video because this one is more for the rookie investors. Um, but yeah, ask your consultant right for these advanced questions. They should know. And if they don't know, then they're the wrong consultant to be asking. Okay, so that being said, I'm going to end this off with tips and tricks of um, you know having investing for the past five years. And uh, hopefully it's not too boring for you guys. Okay, so well, first of all, in stock picking, try to invest in companies that you believe in. Um, why I say that is because, can you imagine if you're invested into a company that you have no idea what it's about? Say, meme stocks like back then, AMC, GameStop. A lot of people never knew what these stocks were about. And when it dropped, plummeted 50%, 60%, you'll be there thinking, oh my God, should I sell now? Oh, I don't know. I don't really know much about this company. Then you're asking your friend panicking, should I sell, should I sell? But if you're invested into a company like, for myself, I'm a huge Apple fan. Everything I use is Apple. Apple phone, MacBook, iPad, every, everything. Apple Watch, is. these are all Apple. So I highly believe in Apple as a company, right? So even if Apple stock drops by 30%, 40%, I'm not going to worry. I'm sure I definitely will worry a little bit, but it's not going to be as worrying as if a random stock, I have no idea what it's about, um, dips by 40%, right? So if Apple drops by 30, 40%, right, I know that with quite high certainty that this stock will eventually go back up again, right? So that brings me to my next point. If you have never invested before and your first thought is, oh, I want to try day trading. I want to earn $1 million. I want to be a millionaire. Please don't because day trading is very, very technical. It You'll never master it. You, it's a never-ending learning journey. Nobody masters uh, day trading, right? And day trading, 80% of people who try for the first time, they lose money. 20%, I guess they're lucky. Maybe 15% lucky and 5% of the people actually are getting good at it. So but I'm not saying don't do day trading, but if you want to, try with a paper account first. Don't dive right in and use real money. Okay, next, if you're looking for the shortest term investment with the highest returns, I'm telling you that does not exist, okay? Okay, not that it doesn't exist, it does exist. But it's not meant for people like us. Probably the one or two percent of the people in the world have opportunities that give them guaranteed high returns in the shortest amount of time. Story for another day, but generally, 
try to look more mid to long term rather than always I want the short term and the highest returns it's very very hard to come by and even if someone promises you that what well, generally nobody can promise you a very high return in a short period of time it's usually not guaranteed and it usually comes with a lot of risk so just make sure you know what you're getting yourself into Next, if you're a rookie investor and you're considering things like CFDs, CFDs stand for contracts for difference, so things like options or forex, um, like point number two, not that I'm telling you not to do it, but be a bit more safe, be a bit more wary, try trading with a paper account first before spending actual money. Um, next, also know that hindsight is always twenty twenty. There's no point in saying, oh, imagine if I invested, you know, $1,000 here, I would have a million now. Imagine if, oh no, if only I... Let me give you an example, okay? If you take a look at this particular crypto coin, okay, I'm pretty sure you guys heard of this back then, Shiba Inu coin, also known as SHIB, okay? They say that if you invested $1,000, 2020, September 1st, okay? At the peak, it will be worth... $132 million. Okay, so let me pose you a question, right? Because a lot of people say, oh, I shit, man, I bought into sheep at, you know, a certain point of time and I cashed out too early. I could have made $100 million. I could have made $50 million. To be honest, right? If you, in first of all, if you had invested that $1,000 in 1st September 2020, okay, that $1,000 goes up to $2,000, meaning to say that you double your money in, let's say, a couple of months' time. Let's say in two months, you double your money. Would you cash out that $2,000? Now, some of you would say, no, la, I won't cash out, la, I will still hold. Okay, hey, hindsight 2020, yeah. at that point in time, if you invested a thousand and it doubled, I'm quite sure that a bunch of you would actually cash out the, the two thousand dollars. Okay, but let's just say some of you say, oh, I still would have stayed invested because two thousand is nothing. From two thousand, it quintuples to ten thousand, meaning to say that it's a thousand percent return. 10x, you put in a thousand dollars, it jumps all the way to ten thousand. Would you cash out at that point? Some of you will still say, no, I won't cash out. 10,000 is not life-changing money. I'll, I'll wait till it goes to the moon. Okay, 10,000 you won't. But most of the people would have. From 1,000 to 10,000, 10x is not easy to come by. Okay, so at 10,000, if you didn't cash out, what if it went to a million dollars? Come on, la, tell me you won't cash out at a million dollars. From 1,000 to a million, that's a, that's a whole-ass condo. You don't even have to downpay. You can full cash the condo. So from 1,000 to a million, 99.99% of the people will have cashed out. Okay, so hindsight 2020, who in the right mind would think that from investing $1,000 and it go, having gone up all the way to a million, think that million is nothing, I'm just going to wait because I feel like I can go to 10 million, 100 million. You won't because fact of the matter is most of you will end up cashing out at a million dollars or way, way before it hit a million dollars. So just know that hindsight is always 2020. Don't beat yourself up on, oh, I should have invested or oh, imagine if doesn't do any good. Next, some people like to say, just invest into the S&P, um, indices, outperform, actively manage mutual funds all the time. Yes, if you are savvy enough, if you have the time, if you don't mind learning a little bit, because it's not as simple as creating an account and just buy the stock, buy S&P every single month. There's still a little bit of research that you need to do, right? Okay, first of all, creating an account is simple no problem right next you want to transfer your money in you also want to know which platform to use do i use tiger do i use mumu etoro td ameritrade there's so many platforms out there do i use scythe each platform has different fees you have commission fees bid offer spread custodian fee currency conversion fee you have so many underlying fees that you might want to do a bit of research into all of these because maybe you want to get a bank for buck so apart from that you realize that Yes, because you're savvy, you might know that you cannot invest in S&P. You can only invest into an S&P ETF. But if you're new, if you're a rookie investor, you try going into S&P, you try and click invest into the S&P. You can't because it's an index. You can't invest into an index. You only can invest into an ETF that tracks the S&P. Now, there are so many S&P ETF trackers out there. Which one are you going to choose, right? Some of them have varying fees. Some people might say, just invest into SPY. Oh, I mean, yes, you know because you are of a certain savviness. But someone who is not savvy might not know, might not have the time to learn about these things, and they might just need someone to manage it for them. And it's all right. It's okay, right? So it's not that simple, just invest into the S&P. Reach out to your financial consultant or advisor or an RM or IC from a bank. Maybe bounce some ideas off of them, get their point of view, maybe speak to a, a savvy friend and then make your decision from there. Next, sometimes it's better to cut your losses and know where to get out of a stock. So about a year and a half ago, I started to shift slowly bit by bit my growth stocks into blue chips, my growth stocks into fixed income, uh, fixed deposits because I, I decided to 
it's better to cut my losses and hold cash or it's better to cut my losses and hold it in fixed Ds or you know blue chips that I really strongly believe in because to me um, one of my investment strategies during a recession is to pull some money out of growth stocks and put it into blue chips right so that's what I did I sold them at a loss some of them I sold at a loss some of them I sold at a profit but you need to know when to cut your losses rather than if I hadn't sold my growth stocks at you know a year a year and a half ago I'll be down 40 to 50 percent more as compared to at that point so certain times it pays to cut your losses Next, a lot has changed over the years, right, in terms of asset class. There's so many new asset classes, there's so many newer investments, new instruments, newer vehicles to put your money into. But one thing still hasn't, and it is the law of compounding. Many, many things have changed over the past many, many decades. But thinking long term still has not changed. Law of compounding is still here. Exponential growth is still here, especially if you invest over the long term. So I know it's not a very attractive thing to do. You know, think long term. Most people are quite short-sighted. They want the most amount of money in the shortest period of time. But do also set some money aside for the long term. Not all of it, but just a small amount of money for the long term. It will pay off. Next, passive income is not built overnight, right? Even the smallest investments can amount to something huge. I give you an example. This is something that I'm pretty sure a lot of you have seen online, but let me just reiterate the story for those who haven't. So if you're 18 years old and you invest $10 a day, right? $10 a day for 10 years and you don't invest anything thereafter, meaning to say $10 a day, which is $300 a month, which is $3,600 a year, which is $36,000 in 10 years. You don't invest a single cent thereafter, $36,000 across 10 years and you hold it to your retirement which is around 60 to 65 let's just say 65 at 65 years old based on an average 10 percent roi i'm just basing off the s p 10 percent roi from 18 to 65 only having invested 36,000, it compounds and grows into 1.8 million dollars right so this is the law of compounding you're only investing 36,000 dollars. it's not a lot it's very very little 300 dollars a month so don't uh, uh, underestimate the power of compounding. Lastly, always have a trusted financial advisor, investment consultant, or relationship manager that you can bounce ideas off and rely on, right? Someone who really knows their stuff, right? Re they really know the markets. They are very competent. You want to have someone that at any point of time, you can just say, hey bro, let's catch up for, you know, tea. And I want to bounce some ideas off. You I want to get your thoughts on my current portfolio. How's it doing in this market? Should I be switching out and rotating uh, uh, over to blue chips? Should I be reducing my exposure to US with the current uh, SVB crisis? And what, what are your thoughts on how UBS just bought over CS? These things. You want to have someone who knows the market and can be there to share with you his thoughts or his investment strategies in the next 6 to 12 months or his long-term strategies. Someone you really trust. Right, and if you really go and take these 10 tips and tricks and you internalize them and you try your best to follow through with them, I can tell you that you'll be a much better investor or you'll see much better returns as I did, you know, when I was five years ago. Because five years ago, I had no one to teach me. I, I made all these mistakes and I learned, I learned from my mistakes. You guys don't have to learn from your own mistakes. You can learn from my mistakes. Okay, and anyway, that is essentially it, right? Thanks for staying to the end. I believe this is going to be quite a long video. I think it's going to be like 20 minutes long or something. I'm going to try and cut it as short as possible because I keep, you know, I keep digressing. I'm very, very talkative, but this, that's just me. So if you guys need any help with personal finance, wealth management, investment management, anything finance related, please feel free to reach out to me on Instagram or you can just leave a comment in the comment section below. And don't forget to like and subscribe because it really helps grow my channel and I'm really trying to hit that thousand subscriber mark by June. That's just a personal goal I set for myself and I'll see you guys in the next video.